Today on Monkey Life. A health check for newly rescued Tamarin Red raises cause for concern. There's been some sort of traumatic incident that's just slightly dislocated her knee. Newcomer Capuchin Matty squares up to dominant male Erico when the group of 14 come together for the first time. It is fairly tense, I'm not going to lie. Um, Matty is definitely focused on Erico. And a sticky treat of porridge and cranberries for the chimps. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. Hi! <laughs> Look at that. Oh, he's fantastic. The park provides a home for more than 260 primates from 25 different species. It's been just over a week since Alison took in a red-bellied tamarind, abandoned by its owner and rescued by the RSPCA. The small primate is the only one of its kind at the park. The team have named her Red, and she's settling in well to her new life at Monkey World. Her personality has really been shining through. Um, I think she was just really lonely, um, because whenever we come over to give her attention or to give her some food, she's straight over. She loves a chat. Um, and she's not doing it in sort of a worried way or a concerned way at all. She just comes over and starts chatting to you because I think she's so starved for company. Um, and yeah, she's just a pretty, a pretty confident little lady. She loves her insects, um, absolutely loves them, particularly crickets. When I first brought one of those out to show her, she was so excited. Um, but yeah, she's a really nice, chilled out little girl and, and a very, very sociable character. Red had been abandoned in a cage at a rented flat in Wales. The RSPCA, called in by the property's landlord, contacted Alison for help. The tamarind didn't have a good diet, little water, and had a swollen stomach. When she arrived at the park, the care team noticed her faeces contained large amounts of sawdust and she was continuously drinking, which raised alarm bells. She does still drink a little bit more than everybody else does on average, but that can also be a learned behaviour out of boredom um, and hopefully not a diet thing because now that she's getting the proper, proper diet, the drinking has, has become much more stable. Her stomach looks a lot less sort of hard and bloated now. Um, so I think it's mostly, touch wood, sorted itself out. But before any further decisions are made about Red's future, she needs a health check. Local vet Dave Harding has arrived to carry out Red's medical examination. If she gets the all clear, the team will start thinking about where she can be housed and finding her some company vital for all primates. Red is put under with gas, using a specially constructed anaesthetic box for small primates. Dave examines her abdomen, looking for any signs of bloating. It feels okay. I mean, there, there's, there's, it feels like there's a fair bit of food in there, but, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's nothing terribly hard or worrying. A relief for the team. Next, he checks her teeth. Just looks like there's a slight chip on the right. Canine. The tamarind's molars are worn down and stained, a sign of her age. She isn't a youngster. Dave examines her back legs and has concerns. That left seems to extend quite nicely and the right seems to get so far and then... I, I wonder what the position of that patella is actually because it, it does look abnormal. All right, should we get some x-rays next then? Yeah. Okay. The pictures should help Dave understand what's causing the mobility issue with Red's right leg. OK. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, the x-rays show uh, that she's... Uh, at some stage, we suspect that there's been some sort of traumatic incident that's just slightly dislocated her knee, so it can't extend properly. So everything is now set in that position, so short of sort of major reconstructive surgery, which is not terribly practical, 
uh, it, it might be something she has to, to live with. So it may be that giving her painkillers might just help her use that leg a bit more. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see, really. It's worrying for her future healthcare, but something the team can probably manage with medication and by adapting the branching in Red's living areas to make it easier for her to move around. The tamarin is returned to the house to recover. When the blood results come back, the care team can begin to plan the next stage of Red's future and consider who might make a suitable companion. At the Capuchin Lodge, the team have been forging ahead with introductions for newcomers Matty and Louis. The pair have now met everyone, either individually or in small groups, and also experienced the entire house and both outside enclosures. Female Louis has fitted in well and her overall condition is improving. But Matty's introductions have been more complex. His meetings with leader Erico resulted in a few scuffles and minor injuries, as both males attempted to exert their authority. As a result, the troop has been separated into smaller subgroups. But today, that's all about to change. So today we've actually decided just to open the doors now between the males and the females. Um, Matty has also met all of the females, so he is fine with them. It's just really how the females are going to react in terms of having Erico and Matty there together. Are they going to side with one or the other? Is it going to change the dynamics of the group, which it probably will. And that's just something that we need to play out. But until we do that, we don't know how it's going to go. But we decided to bite the bullet and just go for it today. Because she's unsure how the group will react, Donna's giving them plenty of space. We're just going to do the introduction with the house and the cage enclosure. So obviously we can have a couple of people in and a couple of people out. And then hopefully if everything goes well, we'll be able to open up the forest enclosure just to give them a bit more space so that they're not as tense. And then they can just mingle with each other as and when they choose to. We're not forcing them all together. Everything is ready and the capuchins are lining up. Everybody seems very keen to see everyone else. With so many slides and entrances, keeping an eye on all 14 capuchins inside and out will be a challenge. But the team are prepared for all eventualities. The group emerge, heading in various directions. The significance of the day has eluded some of the females, including Zoe, who's happy in the playroom, foraging amongst the wood wool for food. Louis is content in their company. Matty, however, has opted for the outside caged enclosure where, within minutes, a bit of jostling for position begins. Marlo and best buddy Abby face off with Matty, and dominant female Phoenix enters the fray to try and act as peacemaker. Some of the low rankers wisely keep out of the way, as dominant male Erico and his sidekick Sean stick close together, unsure what to do. It is fairly tense, I'm not going to lie. Um, Matty is definitely focused on Erico, so we just need him to chill out a little bit, really, and for things to calm down. As the morning progresses, there's a lot of coming and going. If Matty goes inside, Erico heads outside. But it seems Matty may have had a scuffle with someone and come off worse. He's sporting a minor graze above his left eye. Matty was certainly trying to rally round all of the females against Erico and Sean. He didn't really follow through with it, so I think he really was just making a point. We're still very early days. Things have settled a lot. Um, so we just need to see how it plays out in time. Donna decides against giving all the Capuchins access to the larger forest enclosure for now. I think as it stands at the moment, we don't really feel comfortable that nobody's going to go out there and sit out there or be chased or... I think we're just going to stick where we are for now and then in time, once they're a little bit more settled and everyone's happily moving around each other, then we'll consider giving them the extra space. It's only been six weeks since Matty and Louie arrived at the park and they've already made remarkable progress. If the group settle down well overnight, Donna and the team may try again tomorrow. At the stumpy enclosure, life is generally pretty harmonious, albeit grumpy for the seven so-called ugly monkeys who make up the group. They enjoy being outside and making the most of the warm weather. 
a bounty of fresh food, courtesy of the primate care team, goes down well too. But it's been a turbulent few weeks for the group and their carers, following the sudden, unexpected loss of female Stumpy Charlie. Everybody loved Charlie. She was just a generally, as far as Stumpies go, she was quite nice. She wasn't really horrible to anyone. Um, yeah, so it sort of changed, changed the dynamics a bit, losing her. And now there are worries about Sam too. His mobility has got worse and worse. His spine has become more hunched and sort of his back curved and climbing and moving around isn't so easy. Um, he's had sort of ongoing issues with coughing and things. So often we'll come in and we'll find he's very sleepy in the mornings or the evenings. He's just generally slowing down. Obviously we're just having to keep a very close eye on him. And I think sort of sadly, we're sort of starting to come in towards the end of sort of Sam's time. Sam has done well to reach the grand age of 34. He's the only survivor of 19 stump-tailed macaques rescued by Allison from a British laboratory 22 years ago. The stumpies were being used for asthma research. When they arrived at the park, they were an obese bunch with poor mobility and social skills. But Monkey World gave them a fresh start with access to the outdoors and a proper diet. Their numbers have dwindled over the years due to old age and their former life caged in the laboratory where medical experiments took their toll, leaving Sam the last one standing. He's been in charge of the group for over 10 years, really. Um, he was in charge of the male group before the females arrived, and then sort of he came down and took straight over that group. So from when they arrived, the, the girls have had Sam as their boss. Yeah, every, every, all the girls love Sam. He's such a nice, dominant male, and sort of they, they do respect him and sort of spend their time with him. Given his age, it's surprising neither of the two younger males, Freddy and Toto, have staged a coup to take over the group. Toto is an impressive looking male, but can't master stumpy etiquette. Freddy is more socially aware, but shows no signs of wanting to be the dominant male, yet. It's been a surprise that neither of them have ever actually challenged Sam, but I think a lot of that is possibly to do with the respect and backing that Sam has had from the females. Um, they do like Sam, they respect Sam, and those two boys have got to prove their worth and work their way up the hierarchy. It is a very strict hierarchy, the Stumpies, and change is very, very rare. It takes quite a lot for someone to move up or down the group. But it's now an elderly group, with Sylvie, at 23, the youngest. Most have mobility issues of one kind or another. Dominant female Kelly has always maintained her close relationship with Sam, but she also got on really well with Charlie. Her loss has resulted in Kelly becoming slightly withdrawn and quiet. Sadly, Sam's health deteriorated further in the following days, and the primate care team had to make the difficult but important decision to put him to sleep. It was another huge blow for the team and the Stumpy group. The passing of the wise old man of the troop will leave a big hole and change the group dynamic forever. What we hope will happen is that Freddy and Toto will just step up, sort out their hierarchy and run the group as sort of one and two, a bit like Sam and Jonathan did really, um, and that the girls will just sort of fall into line and that we can have a harmonious Stumpy group for sort of the, the upcoming future. Um, and yeah, that the girls and the two boys can sort of live happily together. The primate care teams love to mix things up to keep their charges engaged and busy. This morning, it's the turn of the only troop of spider monkeys at the park. Donna is putting out an enrichment of bamboo and plantain a fruit the three spider monkeys have never tried before. Plantain contains more starch and less sugar than ordinary bananas, which the group are used to. It may give their leader, Pumpkin, food for thought. It's quite difficult with the hierarchy in terms of making sure that everybody really gets their fair share of the food. Pumpkin is larger than the two boys. Because she is so dominant, she gets a higher portion of the food than they do which is a natural thing. It's very difficult for us to really limit that other than separating them every single time that we feed them, which just isn't practical. 
Um, so we monitor their feeding um, and we do have to supplement hickory and flint a little bit just to make sure that they are hitting their calories uh, target throughout the day. The plantain is being skewered on the bamboo, which has been distributed all around the enclosure. The troop will have to work to tear it open and free it from the thick canes. Come on in, spiders! Unsurprisingly, it's Pumpkin who leads the trio out. She's always first in the queue for food. She's followed by Flint and, bringing up the rear, the old man of the group, Hickory, who isn't as food orientated as the other two. They're keen to discover what's different today, but not quite sure what to make of it. Flint is more interested in the fresh green bamboo leaves than the large plantain threaded through the canes. Spider monkeys are perfectly adapted for climbing, with disproportionately long legs and arms. Their long prehensile tails are highly effective anchors at height and allow them to feed underneath the tree canopy. Pumpkin demonstrates her balancing skills as she tries to reach a plantain deep in the bamboo eventually managing to prise it free. Although the outer skin of the fruit is tough, the spider monkey's sharp teeth and powerful jaws enable them to rip it open. Hickory has stayed on the ground while his more active housemates feed enthusiastically above him. He can't believe his luck when a plantain drops and lands right in front of him. An unexpected bonus at no effort. The spider monkeys are all trying the plantain, but there's none of the excited chatter Donna was hoping for. I think they thought it was going to be something more exciting like actual banana. Um, I mean, it's certainly keeping them busy and they, they are eating it. They're just not that excited about it. Interest wanes in favour of the view from the tunnel, where they can relax and sunbathe. It's a glorious day, and at Hanania's chimp enclosure, the group are outside making the most of the sunshine. There are 18 members in this troop, and they've evolved into a close-knit, happy and healthy bunch. While the chimps are enjoying themselves outside, Inside, primate care team member Jess is busy cooking up a warming treat. The park has been given a large donation of cranberries, and Jess is heating them up in fruit squash before adding the mixture to some hot porridge oats. We could give it out to them as hot juice, which they do really enjoy, but adding oats and putting them in a kong, it's just more um, enriching for them because it takes them longer. Um, to solve the puzzle, and especially during the colder months, we like to give them war, like warm juice, warm enrichment. It just helps prevent colds and keeps them warm and healthy. With some of the troop looking on in anticipation, Jess stuffs the hot, mushy concoction into dog toys, known as Kongs. It'll give the chimps something to think about and slow them down a little. And there's plenty to go round. When we give out enrichment, we need to make sure that there's enough for everyone, um, to make sure that it's fair, we don't cause any disagreements. Um, so here we've got enough for three each. Um, I wish I could say that it would, it would be that easy, that they'd all know what to, how much to take, but that at least means if you have a higher ranker like Johnny or Hananya who take more than their share, there should, there should be enough for then our lower rankers to have some as well. Um, but I've also left some cranberries loose um, so we'll throw them out as a scatter at the same time so that if anyone does miss out on a Kong, which hopefully they won't, there's still something for them to enjoy. So we're going to hear some excited noises, hopefully. She's not wrong. Cranberries are a great source of vitamins and antioxidants, which will help boost the chimp's immunity, useful at this chilly time of year. But Hananya and his chums are simply anticipating something delicious is heading their way. It's so nice to hear them like this. It's, it's great because they're not too excited. It's just that right level, um, which is why enrichment's so amazing for them. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting the Kongs to them and seeing, seeing how they react. Um, some of them might not like cranberries, so we'll <laughs> have to see if the excitement's worth it. Are you ready, everyone? Here you go. 
Jess starts with a scatter feed to split the group up. Then the Kongs are thrown in from two different towers to give everyone a chance of securing at least one. Oh, Trudy! It's a mad scramble for the much sought after Kongs, especially by the more dominant chimps. Hananya's second in command, Simon, is quick off the mark to back two. But Cherry is happy to hoover up any loose cranberries she can find. The chimps are used to Kongs, including porridge filled ones. But today's extra ingredient promises to be one sticky mess. Johnny is determined to nab as many as she can. Oh, Johnny, he's stealing everything. <laughs> Cherry! We love Johnny, but yeah, she does, she does um, throw weight around a bit. She is our dominant female, so if she can get our hands on the good stuff, she will. Um, but that's also why we've got the scatter of cranberries, so that if she does steal off individuals, they can still, you know, get some nice, some nice treats as well. Um, Patricia is, is a good individual as well. You'll see her wandering around with more than she can carry, really, um, which is always quite entertaining to watch. Has everyone got one? Good. The chimps quieten down as they tuck into the porridge-filled Kongs. Clever Marjoline uses a stick as a utensil to scoop out the food inside. Chimps in the wild are known for demonstrating similar behaviour. It helps reach the food fingers can't. Cherry has a more basic technique. Trudy and Arthur forage in the grass for the cranberry scatter feed. While Hananya uses his position as leader to help himself to one of Cherry's from right under her nose. The group makes short work of the porridge-filled Kongs, and after all the excitement, it's good to find a nice warm spot to snuggle down in the sunshine. Next time on Monkey Life, Paolo protests during a woolly weigh-in He does get frustrated quite quickly when things don't always go his way. And the Capuchin's box clever when it comes to tracking down treats.